Inpatient Diabetes Management is the new course on Hospitalista channel. By the end of this course, you will be able to confidently handle most if not all the diabetes issues that come up when a patient is in the hospital. The course focuses on practical knowledge that you can use in real world situations. We will cover a range of topics. First, we will discuss why inpatient diabetes management can be more challenging than home. Second, we will go over the best strategy for blood sugar monitoring and discuss the different blood sugar targets. Third, I will discuss how to recognize, treat, and prevent hypoglycemia in inpatient settings. Fourth, we will discuss insulin physiology and the different insulin formulations frequently used in inpatient settings. Fifth, we will discuss other diabetes medication classes. Then I will delve into the best inpatient blood sugar control strategies and we will spend some time here discussing in detail basal bolus insulin therapy the best use of the insulin sliding scale and how to make your own sliding scale, how to adjust your regimen based on blood sugar values, including difficult to control hyperglycemia, early morning hypoglycemia, persistent hypoglycemia, how to transition into and from insulin drip. Then I will have a dedicated video for DKA followed by non-ketotic hyper smaller hyperglycemia with common pitfalls in management I see all the time. And we will finish by talking about practical issues when a diabetic patient is discharged from the hospital. A lot of these issues will be covered more than once during the course so it sticks in our minds. Today we will discuss why inpatient diabetes management can be more challenging than home and before we start if you would like to receive a PDF summary of the videos released on the channel sign up using the link provided in the description field. If you have already signed up, this summary should be in your inbox 24 hours after the video is released. Let's start. For a patient, the hospital is never like home. This is particularly true for diabetic patients. The stress of sickness and illness, the expected change in calorie intake, different meals time schedule, the possible use of IV fluid, and the change in the patient's medications all these factors can impact glycemic control in diabetic patients during their hospital stay. Let's go over these possible challenges and see how can we handle them in real life settings. The stress of sickness or illness by itself can exacerbate hyperglycemia, but we should not do any preemptive adjustments to the blood sugar control plan or strategy. Let the blood sugar values guide you on this. In addition, the illness can lead to decreased calorie intake due to change in appetite or being unable to eat like in NPO status. This necessitates the discontinuation of oral diabetic medications and the use of an insulin only treatment plan instead. We will discuss how to do that later in the course. Now, hospital meal times are often different from those at home. Typically, all three meals are served within 8 to 12 hours, leaving up to almost 14 to 15 hours between an early dinner and late breakfast. This can increase the risk of early morning hypoglycemia. To prevent this, patients with well-controlled diabetes should be given what we call bedtime snacks. Patients with uncontrolled diabetes, basically their blood sugar values averaging 250 or above, typically do not require bedtime snacks unless they develop early morning hypoglycemia. When we say bedtime snacks, they should be provided around 9 to 10 p.m and it's important to communicate this to the nurse and to the patient. If morning hypoglycemia persists despite bedtime snacks, it is important to verify that patient is eating the bedtime snacks like crackers, etc. as recommended before considering adjustments to their diabetes regimen. How about IV fluid? Intravenous fluid that contains dextrose D5, D10 may be used for medications administration or to address water deficits in hyper natremia cases specifically or mainly D5W where the patient is unable to drink water right however dextrose solutions can potentially on the other hand exacerbate hyperglycemia so they are generally avoided in diabetics except in cases where hypoglycemia is a concern if dextrose containing solutions must be used for a reason or another, adjustments to patient's blood sugar control plan should be considered based on their blood sugar values. Again, avoid preemptive adjustments here. New medications are frequently prescribed in hospitalized patients. 
Corticosteroids are widely used in inpatient settings and are notorious for worsening hyperglycemia, which frequently requires adjustment to blood sugar control strategy. Preemptive adjustments should be done only for those with already poorly controlled diabetes and you add corticosteroids. Otherwise, add corticosteroids and let the blood sugar values guide your adjustments. Now there are some other antibiotics like gatifloxacin, beta blocker, thiazide diuretics, some second generation antipsychotics, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, and protease inhibitors HIV medication all can have a hyperglycemic effect, but I wouldn't worry much about them in inpatient settings. On the other hand, some medications may have hypoglycemic effects such as pentamidine, quinine, which rarely used in inpatient settings, endomethacin, Bactrim, and glucagon. Again, I wouldn't worry much or make preemptive adjustments if using any of these medications let the blood sugar values guide you. Now, let's talk about home diabetes medications and whether a patient's home diabetic regimen should be maintained, modified, or discontinued when a patient is admitted to the hospital. For the sake of this, I'm going to divide diabetes medications into insulin and non-insulin medications. And let's start with non-insulin medication. They are either injectable or Oral. and various factors here determine whether to continue them or not when a patient is admitted to the hospital. We do stop all non-insulin based treatments if one of the following is present. If the patient is critically ill in the ICU, DKA patient, non-ketotic hyperosmolar or hyperglycemia patients, MPO status, patients with poor oral intake and the presence of a specific contraindication to a particular agent or the patient already have poorly controlled diabetes on present. This means if the patient, on the other hand, is not critically ill, not hypoglycemic, diabetes is well controlled at home, there are no specific or particular contraindication to any specific agent, and the patient is not NPO or expected to have a reduced oral intake, then it should be safe to resume certain non-insulin diabetic medications like metformin, sulfonylureas, and DPP-4 inhibitors like cytagliptin. Now, GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGL2 inhibitors, thiazolidinidiones or whatever, meglinitides and alpha-glucosidase inhibitors are usually discontinued on admission and resumed on discharge if no contraindications. They have really little effect on hyperglycemia in acute settings. In addition, all of these or most of these medications are not available in most hospital formularies. Now, now, some may argue about the thiazodilidinediones, whatever. This class is disappearing in clinical practice, and I don't recall when was the last time I admitted a patient uh, taking one of them. And don't worry, even temporary interruption of them is not a big deal as their antihyperglycemic effect extends for several weeks. Now, how about home insulin regimens? Here we ask ourselves the following questions. Does the patient require continuous insulin infusions or what we call insulin drip? If yes, discontinue all home insulin regimens including insulin pumps and inhaled insulin which remains uncommon in clinical settings. Next, if insulin drip is not required, is the patient NPO or has a poor oral intake? If yes, discontinue rapid acting pre-meal insulins, but continue long acting insulin at a reduced dose, usually by 50%. Now, how about if the patient is on insulin pump? Insulin pumps use rapid acting insulin, but the insulin is delivered into two ways. A continuous infusion rate throughout the 24 hours or what we call a basal infusion rate and bolus doses the user instruct the pump to give based on carb counts when they eat or if they have high blood sugar readings. The basal infusion rate is dealt with similarly to long acting insulin and should be resumed at a reduced dose on those patients who are in PO or with decreased oral intake. Bolus doses on the other hand should be discontinued similar to pre-meal insulin. Next, if the patient is eating, then the pre-meal rapid acting insulin and long acting insulin should be resumed at the same or slightly reduced rate. The same applies to insulin pumps. Now, how to make these insulin adjustments will be discussed later in the course when we talk about blood sugar control strategies. Before I give you some real life clinical scenarios, make sure to familiarize yourself with your hospital formularies to see what kind of insulin and diabetes medication classes they carry. Let me give you now some real world clinical scenarios to help you understand this more.
this patient has well controlled diabetes on a diabetic diet I don't anticipate a decrease in their oral intake and for those reasons I would continue metformin and cytagliptin in addition I will add bedtime snacks to prevent early morning hypoglycemia This lady clearly is acutely ill with decreased oral intake. So all non-insulin diabetic medications should be held. So metformin should be stopped. Insulin glargine is a long acting insulin and should be resumed at a reduced dose, probably by 50% if not more. No pre-meal rapid acting insulin should be prescribed. And non ketotic hyperosmolar hyperglycemia patients need insulin drip. All home diabetes medications, including home insulin, should be discontinued. The insulin pump should be switched off for this patient as well. The patient is in PO here, so pre-meal rapid acting insulin uh, as part uh, should be discontinued and the long acting insulin glargine uh, should be resumed probably at 50% of the original dose. Unless the patient is hypoglycemic, I would recommend for the IV fluid against dextrose containing IV fluid. Remember also type 1 diabetics have no endogenous insulin and can easily go into DKA if left without any insulin. So make sure to give them insulin. Now here, despite the diet order, this patient seems acutely ill and oral intake may be re reduced. I will discontinue the premier rapid acting insulin Lispro, resume his long acting insulin Detimer uh, at a reduced dose, probably again by 50% and stop the impagliflozin as this medication have little impact on acute hyperglycemia, the SGL2 inhibitors. Don't forget to resume on discharge if no contraindications given their mortality benefits in heart failure. In the end, I hope you found this video useful. If so, please hit the like button, share it with your colleagues and subscribe to the, our channel if you have not done so. In the next video, we will discuss the best blood sugar monitoring strategies and the different blood sugar targets in inpatient setting.